Hi friends, I am Dr. Anjani Dikshit Singha. Today we are going to discuss female reproductive system. In this, we are going to discuss ovarian cycle, uterine cycle and how they are interconnected with each other. So let's, uh, let's start with the uh, story. This begins, everything begins in brain. So uh, what happens is in the hypothalamus, there are two types of nuclei arcuate nucleus and preoptic nucleus. These arcuate and preoptic nucleus, they release a special type of hormone called as gonadotropin releasing hormone. This gonadotropin releasing hormone is released from the hypothalamus and it acts on a special cell in the pituitary which is called as gonadotrops. These gonadotrops on stimulation of, uh, on stimulation by gonadotropin releasing hormone release what? gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to release what gonadotropin so these gonadotropin are released from the pituitary from where from gonadotropin from gonadotrops and upon the stimulation by which hormone gonadotropin releasing hormone there are two types of gonadotropin one is follicle stimulating hormone and the other is luteinizing hormone now these FSH and LH, a follicle stimulating hormone also called as FSH and luteinizing hormone also called as LH. These FSH and LH are then act over the ovary and they, from there they start what we call as ovarian cycle. Now before we discuss ovarian cycle, we need to have a quick discussion on something. So in the female fetus, there are several germ cells. These germ cells are called as oogonia. What are germ cells? Germ cells are the cells which are going to give rise to egg in the female fetus and sperm in the male fetus. Okay. Now these oogonia start their mitosis at 6 to 8 weeks of gestation. They start their mitosis at what? This is a very important MCQ. They start at 6 to 8 weeks of gestation. So this mitosis, this mitosis that starts at 6 to 8 weeks of gestation is so fast that by 16 to 17 weeks of gestation, their number reaches 6 to 7 million, 6 to 7 million. This is the maximum ovonal content in the female fetus, in the female ovary. So this is again an important MCQ. What is the maximum ovonal content? 6 to 7 million. At what period of gestation it happens? 16 to 20 weeks of gestation. Now from here onwards, the ovonal content is going to decrease. It will decrease decrease inevitably till menopause. By menopause, what happens? All the oocytes would have been depleted. So, what is happening here? Oogonium undergoes mitosis and we all know mitosis is a duplicative division. But oogonium is a diploid cell. It has two sets of chromosomes, one from the mother and another from the father. So, these, this, these diploid cells undergo mitosis, they maintain their reserve, they keep on dividing till they reach 6 to 7 million at 16 to 20 weeks of gestation and from here on there is continuous decline and the decline is so fast in the start because I tell you in the, the decline is directly proportional to the ugonal content. More the ugonal content, more will be the decline. So, decline in the start is so rapid that at birth there are more 2 million oogonia left. So at birth what is the number? It is 2 million and then at puberty by the time girl hits puberty only 3 lakh oogonia left and then out of these 3 lakh only 400 ovulate in reproductive years. Okay, In the reproductive years of a female only 400 ovulate. Each and every point in this slide is an MCQ. Okay, So once again I am repeating at 6 to 8 weeks oogonia start mitosis. At, by 16 to 20 weeks, they are 6, 6 to 7 million maximum ugonal content. At birth, 2 million. At puberty, 3 lakh. And out of these, 400 ovulate. Okay. Now, let's come to the next point. Now, these ugonia, which are diploid cells, as we talked earlier, they enter into meiosis. They enter into a division called as meiosis. And we all know meiosis has two parts. This is a very, very basic physiology we are, I am talking about. Meiosis has two parts. Meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Meiosis 1 is reductive division. Meiosis 2 is duplicative division. So what happens if a cell undergoes meiosis? This diploid cell forms haploid daughter cells. And these haploid daughter cells then undergo meiotic 2 division. And it duplicate itself. So finally from our uh, diploid parent cell, there are 4 haploid daughter cells okay so what happens similar thing happens with oogonia but with special changes what happens here oogonia which is a diploid cell undergo meiosis 1 it enters into meiosis 1 and then it is the name changes it is now called as primary oocyte now this primary oocyte if is able to complete meiosis 1 will eject first polar body and 
form a secondary oocyte mind you these this secondary oocyte is now what haploid primary oocyte was what was what it was diploid oogonia was what it was diploid so from primary oocyte after meiosis 1 there is secondary oocyte which is haploid and first polar body is ejected out if now this secondary oocyte will undergo meiosis 2 and in this meiosis after the completion of meiosis 2 it will form mature oocyte and second polar body will be ejected now what is important here why this thing is important we have to understand there are two arrests happen in this cycle the first arrest is at diplotene stage of prophase 1 that means from primary oocyte which is a diploid cell to secondary oocyte which is a haploid cell the arrest happen at diplotene stage of prophase 1 and this arrest resumes at the time of ovulation okay did you understand this so when a child is born in the ovary all the primary oocyte are frozen at diplotene stage of prophase 1 when the puberty is attained and ovarian cycle start and the ovulation happens then this meiosis 1 completes secondary oocyte is formed and is ready to enter into meiosis 2 okay so this this first arrest resumes this meiosis 1 is completed at the time of ovulation and the first polar body is ejected now what is the second important point second important point is secondary oocyte when undergoes meiosis 2 again the second arrest happened this arrest happened at metaphase 2 when it happens metaphase 2 and when does it resume it resumes if by god's grace sperm is able to fertilize egg then at the time of fertilization the second polar body is ejected and a mature egg is formed when the secondary oocyte is able to complete its meiosis 2 division okay so two important mcqs here the first the first arrest is at diplotene stage of prophase 1 and the second arrest is at metaphase 2 when does the first arrest goes away it goes away at ovulation and when when does the second arrest goes away it goes away at fertilization okay so this was one, one related extra thing which i told you now let's go back to ov ovulatory cycle okay so in this figure as you can all see that there are this is a cut section of an ovary where there are primordial follicles followed by primary follicle, secondary, tertiary, pre-ovulatory follicle, ovulation and then corpus luteum. This we all know, right? This we all know. Now let's talk about each and every follicle in detail what is happening here. So you have to understand that, sorry. So you have to understand that in the starting all these o primary oocytes are lying latent in the ovary. But when the puberty starts, now the next thing comes, when does the puberty starts? Puberty starts when the gonadotropin, sorry, hypothalamus starts secreting, pulse, start pulsatile release of gonadotropin releasing hormone. So what is the, this is an, again an MCQ point. When, what is the first indicator of onset of puberty? The first indicator of onset of puberty is impulses, pulses of gonadotropin releasing hormone. So first these impulses are mostly at night, then it becomes in the day and then it increases in frequency. So hypothalamus releases GnRH pulses which act on the pituitary, it releases gonadotropin that is FSH and LH and it acts over the ovary and the pubertal changes start, ovarian cycle starts. Now what happens here? So, you have to understand this thing that these primary oocyte lying in the ovary are enveloped by a layer of cells called as granulosa cells. Now, this oocyte enveloped by a layer of granulosa cell is called as primordial follicle. Okay? So, you can see here there are these are primordial follicle lying here. So, they are called as uh, uh, these are uh, uh, covered by granulosa cell, a single layer of granulosa cell and are called as primordial follicle. Now they will now further undergo various stages of development, okay. But the development of these primordial follicle is not as straightforward. It is not that that ovulatory phase uh, when the ov ov ovulatory cycle will be has as it has begun. So, there will be follicular phase, ovulation and luteal phase. No, it is not like that. So, the development of primordial follicle is divided into two broad stages. One is gonadotropin independent, gonadotropins are what? FSH and LH. So, one is gonadotropin independent and the other is gonadotropin dependent. So, in the gonadotropin independent cycle, this 
स्टेज लास्ट फॉर सेवेंटी डेज सो इट गोज बैक मेनी मैंसुरल साइकिल इट डज इट इट इज़ नॉट द केस दैट इन वन मैंसुरल साइकिल योर एग विल भी ऑलरेडी योर फॉलिकल विल भी ऑलरेडी टू रिलीज एन एग सो दिस दीज प्राइमोडियल फॉलिकल अंडर गो आ स्टेज सेवेंटी डेज ऑफ डेवलपमेंट विच इज़ गोनेडो ट्रॉप इन इंडिपेंडेंट एंड दे आर रेडी आफ्टर दी सेवेंटी डेज ऑफ डेवलपमेंट दे आर रेडी टू बी एक्टेड अपॉन बाय एफ एस एच सो अमॉन्ग दीज टू गोनेडोट्रॉपिन इट इज एफ एस एच विच इज रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर फॉलिकुलो जेनेसिस ओनली एफ एस एच इज रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर फॉलिकुलो जेनेसिस नॉट एल एच ओके सो वॉट हैपन्स इन दीज सेवेंटी डेज टाइम पीरियड दीज प्राइमोडियल फॉलिकल अंडर गो सर्टन स्टेजेस ऑफ डेवलपमेंट टिल दे आर रेडी टू बी एक्टेड अपॉन बाय एफ एस एच और रेस्क्यूड बाय एफ एस एच वी विल टॉक अबाउट इट इन डिटेल लेटर ऑल्सो सो दे आर रेडी टू बी रेस्क्यूड बाय एफ एस एच वॉट इज द मीनिंग ऑफ रेस्क्यू वॉट हैपन इज दीज प्राइमोडियल फॉलिकल्स आर कंटिन्यूसली you know getting uh, various stages of development and are undergoing atresia okay so when they are undergoing so there is continuous depletion of the oocyte once the girl is born there is once the that maximum oogonal content is reached at 16 to 20 weeks there is continuous depletion so this continuous depletion is is happening in which way primordial follicles are getting developed and then there is atresia so this to inhibit this atresia fsh act over them okay and when fsh act over them there is rescue or recruitment so there is a cohort of certain cohort of follicle which is getting selected by fsh which cohort of follicle those primordial follicle which have undergone the 70 70 days stage of development and now they are ready to be acted upon by fsh so there is one good uh, one mcq here how many days does this gonadotropin independent uh uh phase last it is 70 days they are res- then they are rescued by fsh and this starts at primary follicle this last till primary follicle so primordial follicle and primary follicle are undergoing gonadotropin independent stage of development then starts gonadotropin dependent stage now this gonadotropin dependent stage is what we call as follicular phase of the ovarian cycle here what happens fsh comes into play it uh, it affects the development maturation fsh and lh de- affects the development and maturation of these follicle and this starts from the preantral stage of the follicle so total if a question comes that total how many days are required for a primordial follicle to attain a pre ovulatory stage what will be the answer the answer will be 70 plus 15 days that is around 85 days it's a very important question so total duration of maturation is of 85 days now in this figure as you can see there are this is primordial follicle then there is primary follicle secondary follicle preantral antral and pre ovulatory follicle now from uh, primordial follicle to primary follicle what is the change that happens that primordial follicle now becomes a primary follicle what happens is primordial follicle was surrounded by a spindle shaped granulosa cell single layer now these granulosa cells start maturing start developing and they multiply and from spindle shape they become now cuboidal shaped okay so that there is change in shape and there is increase in number of the granulosa cell and what happens to oocyte oocyte also increases in size so this is this is now called as primary follicle this is now called as primary follicle now a question can come what is the first visible sign of follicular maturation what will be the answer the answer will be this the change from primordial follicle to primary follicle that is increase in the size of the oocyte and the change in shape of granulosa cell from spindle shape to cuboidal shape okay now then next what happens what happens what happens is in the another thing another thing sorry i forgot to tell you the oocyte also secretes a glycoprotein layer around it a special glycoprotein layer what is it called it is called as zona pellucida yes so it is called as zona pellucida in zona pellucida what happens is that what is the significance of this layer when fertilization happens this this sperm once once one sperm has entered and fertilized the egg this zona pellucida inhibit the entry of all other sperm so it prevents polyspermy it's an again a very important question it inhibits polyspermy another important question there are three types of protein in zona pellucida zp1 zp2 zp3 it is zp3 which is which sperm detects again it is an important question in the zona pellucida there are three important proteins it is zp3 which is getting detected by sperm okay so this is the importance of zona pellucida so in the primary follicle there is going to be multiplication of granulosa cell increase in the size of oocyte and the appearance of zona pellucida <clears throat> now as you can see in the figure this is secondary follicle what happens here you can see a small layer of you know these different color cells here these cells are thicker cells 
What are theca cells? Theca cells are nothing but granulosa cell getting differentiated is specialized. The outermost layer of the granulosa cell they become specialized and now they are called as theca cells. Okay. Then what happens? From secondary follicle, they see in some sources secondary follicle and preantral follicle are uh, you know uh, that these terms are used interchangeably. But preantral follicle is a better term for all the working purposes we are going to discuss in this lecture. But if uh, if question comes and preantral follicle is not in the option for all the working purposes for all the question you can use secondary follicle as well okay so up next figure mein what is happening this is preantral follicle now in the preantral follicle you can see ye red red threads are there these are what these are blood vessels okay so what happens is this theca layer ye jo outermost layering hai theca cells ki in this theca layer vasculogenesis starts what happens vasculogenesis start but the blood vessels have started encroaching this follicle and started supplying the theca cell layer another important question theca cell is vascular layer granulosa cell is a vascular layer okay so theca cell is vascular and a granu granulosa cell is a vascular so abhi jo humne pehle padha tha pichli slide mein ki this gonado this gonadotropin dependent stage of development start from preantral follicle isn't it intuitive that from preantral follicle only vasculogenesis is starting then tabhi to the fsf which is present in blood will be able to reach theca cells will be able to reach follicle and start having its effect and that's why from the preantral stage vasculogenesis has started and thereby follicle start follicle become gonadotropin responsive okay gonadotropin responsive so in this diagram you can see that i have made three stages with respect to uh, uh, of follicular development with respect to gonadotropin okay so these three stages they are the first stage is gonadotropin independent then there is something called as gonadotropin responsive and then gonadotropin dependent what is this gonadotropin responsive now see from in this gonadotropin responsive you can see two stages here preantral and antral preantral and antral it is very important what is what is happening here something really special is happening here from preantral to antral follicle in the researches we have seen that in this stage this is stage follicles are most susceptible to follicular atresia what is the meaning what is the meaning here that see we have talked that in a there is a cohort of follicles again there is a question in one cohort how many follicles are recruited in one go in one cycle in a cohort how many follicles are there the answer is 3 to 11 my uh, lecture is from spiroff all my questions and resources are from spiroff if you have any doubt you can always post your question below in the comment okay but uh, so uh, there the the, the value of this number this 3 to 11 may vary from sources to sources i am quoting spiroff okay so in one cohort or uh, in one cohort of uh, ovulatory cycle there are around 3 to 11 follicles out of in this cohort however this number is variable actually why because as the women start aging the number of follicles start depleting now when number of follicles start depleting the number of follicle in a cohort also start decreasing so in the reproductive years in a young woman there will be more follicles in one cohort but you know this is the average number okay so what is happening is in this one cohort there are 3 to 11 let's say let's assume there are 3 to 11 uh, follicles in one cohort out of this in this competition only one follicle excuse me only one follicle will dominate and form a dominant follicle what happened to the rest of them what happens to rest of them so this is the stage where the competition starts okay so this is the stage and that's why there is this is these are this is these stages are the stages preantral and antral follicle where maximum atresia happens okay so there is one mcq question in this slide at what stage fsh receptors appear first in ovarian cycle tell me just now we talked about at what stage fsh receptors appear first in ovarian cycle if you have if you if the option is preantral follicle then you will mark preantral follicle if it is not in the option then you will mark secondary follicle because this is the stage when vasculogenesis has started and thereby fsh is now able to act on the fsh receptors is it clear hmm okay so before we discuss this why this atresia is happening in this uh, in the this is this is stage of development from preantral to antral follicle let's discuss one very important concept 
So what happens is when this gonadotropin responsiveness starts in the follicle, this these LH and FSH hormones start acting on the follicle. So you have to, so there are two cells, basically two cells we are talking about, theca cells and granulosa cells. Now, theca cells have LH receptors and granulo, granulosa cells have FSH receptors, okay. So what happens is theca cell under the effect of LH, it ha, remember it also has blood supply, okay, it is supplied with blood. It takes all the cholesterol, it takes not all the cholesterol, it takes cholesterol from blood and it forms androgen from the cholesterol because it has certain hormones. So it does steroidogenesis from cholesterol, it forms androgen. Now these granulosa cell under the effect of FSH takes these androgen and aromatize them to form estrogen, okay. So because granulosa cell cannot form androgen, so they take these androgen from the thicker cell, aromatize them and form estrogen. Now this is called as two cell, two gonadotropin theory. Two cell, granulosa cell and thicker cell, two gonadotropin. On granulosa cell, FSH is acting and on thicker cell, LH is acting. And this is how under the effect of FSH and LH, follicles are able to form lots of estrogen. Now, I was not, I, I used to get confused between which cell has which receptor. So, I made a small mnemonic for you guys. Girlfriends talk a lot. So, G for granulosa cell, have F for friend FSH receptor, talk T, thicker cells, L, L, L for LH receptors. Okay. So, girlfriend talks a lot is two cell, two gonadotropin theory. Now your question comes, ovarian steroidogenesis is predominantly dependent on which hormone? What will be the answer? There are two hormones acting here. Ovarian steroidogenesis is dependent on which hormone? So ovaries are forming two hormones under the effect of two hormones. FSH and LH are acting and they are forming androgens and uh, estrogen. Ultimately, it is granulosa cell forming estrogen under the effect uh, of FSH. What, what will be the answer? Ovarian steroidogenesis is dependent predominantly on, answer will be LH, not FSH. Why? Because it is LH which is causing the thicker cell to form androgen from cholesterol. FS, under the effect of FSH, granulosa cells are simply, uh, you know, recycling androgen into estrogen. They are not forming, they are not doing steroidogenesis. Steroidogenesis is happening under the effect of LH, okay? It is a very important question and people get confused in it. Now, you have to understand that these preantral and enteral follicle are in, are in a very delicate balance. These androgens which you know which are helping the granulosa cell to form estrogen which is very important for the survival of the follicle, it is a very tricky thing you know. Androgens are very tricky. Why, why they are tricky? What happens is these androgens when are in less concentration they undergo aromatization and form estrogen which is good. This is what follicle wants. But if androgen increase in concentration in higher concentration, they undergo something called as 5-alpha reduction and they form 5-alpha androgen. This 5-alpha androgen is evil. What it does is, it is not able to convert itself into estrogen and on top of that, it inhibits aromatization. So, 5-alpha androgen is a dead end. So, if androgen concentration rises in a follicle, this 5-alpha androgen will be formed, it will inhibit aromatization and it itself will not undergo aromatization process. On top of that, it will also inhibit FSH induction of LH receptor. So this is an important thing which will happen in the development of the follicle. This, these, this FSH hormone also induce LH receptor on the granulosa cell. We will talk about it later in uh, which is responsible, you know, when the uh, this luteal phase will start. This is very important developmental change that happen in the end stage of the follicular phase of the follicle, okay, because it has to enter in a luteal phase. So this FSH, this FSH induced LH receptor, this is a very important stage, very important uh, thing that happens in a follicle, 5 alpha androgen inhibit this process also. Okay. So, this is important because follicles are undergoing competition. So, good follicles, the comp the really good competitors are those follicles who which have lots and lots of estrogen and less androgen. Okay. Now, before we understand what is happening in the follicle, we have to understand the context, the background in which the follicles are growing. Now what is happening here, as you can see in the figure that 
see this 1 to 14 is the follicular phase this 1 to 14 is the follicular phase and 14 to 28 is the luteal phase so we are taking a 28 days menstrual cycle which is an average you know most commonly 28 days uh, menstrual cycle is seen in a woman so 14 days is follicular phase and 14 days is luteal phase now this day 7 8 9 this is around mid follicular phase okay this in this mid follicular phase is what this change is happening from pre antral to antral follicle now what happens in this mid follicular phase and why excuse me in this mid follicular phase this pre antral to antral conversion why there is so much atresia what is the mystery so what happens is that let's start with fsh so what was happening with fsh our FSH hormone at the starting of the follicular cycle was in decently high concentration. Okay. Now, this is the early follicular phase, but as it reaches the mid follicular phase, it starts declining. It starts declining. Okay. Why this happens? Let us see another hormone. Okay. Now, when follicle, when FSH was start when FSH has started in the starting of the follicular phase when it has started the follicular genesis these follicles have start growing now as they have started growing we have just now discussed under the effect of LH and FSH they are forming estrogen so what happens in the starting of the cycle see this estrogen is in lower concentration but as the cycle progresses and it reaches the mid follicular phase this estrogen start rising can you see this this estrogen is rising now estrogen has a negative feedback action on pituitary and hypothalamus we know this okay so what happens when estrogen concentration in even estrogen concentration is, is rising it inhibits pituitary and hypothalamus and thereby shuts them inhibits them to release lh and fsh but it's not that simple with lh the nature of estrogen changes with its concentration we don't know the reason why this happens but this happens so, in the starting, when estrogen is in low concentration, it is having inhibitory effect on both LH and FSH. But as estrogen concentration keep on rising, because follicles are forming, they are growing and they are forming more and more estrogen, estrogen level is rising. It, on FSH, it will still have an inhibitory effect, but on LH, it will start having positive effect. The, on LH, when it will ha start having positive effect, in around the mid follicular phase, the LH will start rising. LH will start rising and estrogen will also rise in parallel. We will get an estrogen peak. Okay, we will get an estrogen peak and followed by estrogen peak, we will also get an LH peak, which this massive amount of LH under the positive effect of estrogen is called as LH surge. It is a very critical stage and this LH surge is what is responsible for ovulation. We will discuss in a while, but first we have to concentrate on mid follicular phase. Now see, let us let's see the uh, 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 graph of LH as well see this LH so in the starting LH was also in low concentration now as estrogen is rising this LH is also rising there is LH this is LH surge this estrogen is rising we got a peak of estrogen okay and this LH is also rising and we get a peak of LH okay so see in the mid follicular phase see in this mid follicular phase estrogen is rising LH is rising LH is rising here okay and fsh is falling fsh is falling okay now now see what is happening we knew that from our previous discussion that under the effect of lh theca cells are forming androgen okay under the effect of fsh granulosa cells are forming estrogen okay now in the background of the developing follicle there is rising lh there is falling fsh and this estrogen which is rising is coming from the follicle only so what will happen what what is what will happen now the follicles will undergo atresia because this is not what follicle wants follicle wants lots and lots of fsh support so that there is more estrogen this is what is needed for the survival of the follicle but the reverse is happening the lh is rising which promotes androgenesis androgen formation and fsh is falling so in this in the in this in the background of falling fsh the follicles have to grow but how will they grow because fss support is getting withdrawn so these follicles will come to you and they will ask you that why i want to get selected as a dominant follicle tell me what should i do 
this is the this is my background this these adverse conditions are uh, you know happening what should i do what should i do so that i will get selected i should should so that i am able to survive so, so that i am able to survive in the face of falling fsh and i emerge as a dominant follicle what will you answer so for a competitive exam so this is a competition right so for a competitive exam which candidate get selected which candidate get selected in a competitive exam only that the, those candidate get selected who are well prepared so what is the preparation that dominant follicle need to do dominant follicle need to have two things first off they should have lots of fsh receptors if they will have lots of fsh receptor even in the face of declining fsh they will be so sensitive to the even in the lower levels of fsh that they will be able to maintain the uh, aromatization process they will be able to maintain their growth and second important thing is they should have lots of intra follicular estrogen concentration so however the second part is dependent on the first part so they should have lots of fsh receptors and they should have more number of, more quantity of estrogen in fact when the studies were done it was seen that the fresh wave of atresia of the follicles is seen in parallel to the rise of estrogen so what does it indicate this indicate that when all the follicles are dying the dominant follicle is emerging like a sphinx emerging as a dominant follicle the follicle which have maximum fsh concentration maximum intra follicular estrogen concentration that is rising when all the follicles are dying because of atresia because of increasing lh concentration and reducing fsh concentration okay so we should all learn from dominant follicle how to win in an adverse situation okay so we need all need to be very well prepared okay so this is what this is how dominant follicle gets selected now important mcqs here first is view we all should know peaks and uh, surges okay so the first question is with respect to ovulation as you can see here with respect to ovulation when does lh peak appear as we talked about uh, as we talked just now lh peak appear 10 to 12 hours before ovulation and estrogen peak appear 24 to 36 hours before ovulation and then there is something called as onset of ls surge if a question come what is the most reliable indicator of impending ovulation what will be the answer lh peak estrogen peak estrogen surge ls surge what will be the answer the answer will be onset of ls surge onset of ls surge is the most reliable indicator of impending ovulation and when does onset of ls surge happens answer is 34 to 36 hours another important thing this estrogen as we talked just now that estrogen when estrogen levels uh, start rising and they reach a particular concentration they start having positive feedback effect on lh but important thing is this estrogen should be in certain concentration and should be there for certain amount of time okay it's not like thoda sa estrogen badha and then lh peak start lh surge start hogi no there should be some concentration of estrogen for certain amount of time to have a positive feedback effect on the pituitary in order to have ls surge and what is that concentration the concentration of estrogen is 200 picogram per ml that concentration is 200 picogram per ml and the duration is that this concentration of estrogen should be in blood for at least 48 to 50 hours this concentration should be for at least 48 to 50 hours okay another question is that uh, how long this ls surge last this ls surge last for around 48 hours this ls surge last for around 48 hours another important thing always remember that there will be first estrogen peak then only there will be lh peak they do not happen together and if that happens suppose estrogen peak is coming just after the lh peak will not sustain excuse me the lh peak will not sustain it will die out or it will not start only so that estrogen has estrogen peak has to reach that peak concentration of at least 200 picogram per ml and it should there it should be there for at least certain amount of time and then only lh peak will come okay so these are important question here in this slide okay now what happens in ls surge what is this thing that happens in ls surge why ls surge is so important so ls surge causes what it causes resumption of meiosis we talked about earlier we talked earlier that 
in this uh, in this primary oocyte pri our primary oocyte are frozen at what stage diplotene stage or prophase 1 they are all frozen at that stage when ls surge come the meiosis 1 which was frozen at prophase 1 will resume and there will be ovulation there will be ovulation and when this ovulation happen the first polar body will be ejected and the secondary oocyte will be formed which will be a haploid cell and this secondary oocyte will be uh, you know ready for fertilization but again it will get free it get freeze at metaphase 2 correct it will get free it, it will freeze at metaphase 2 another important thing that happen is ls surges it you know uh, uh, it causes the synthesis of all sorts of prostaglandin proteases and scissor enzyme which you know cause which cut the wall of the follicle cut the wall of the ovary and help the egg to come out of the ovary so that it can be picked up by the fimbria of the fallopian tube so there is release of oocyte under the effect of these prostaglandin and proteases which cut the wall of the follicle so that egg is released what else happens in ls surge these granulosa cell they have acquired lh receptors by now okay under the effect of SH, fsh they have acquired lh receptors because they have to function as a corpus luteum we will talk about it they have to function as a special you know hormone synthesizing body later in the luteal phase so they have acquired lh receptors and this process acquiring lh receptors and certain other changes is called as luteinization of granulosa cells so there are three important things that happen in ls surge first is resumption of meiosis secondly you know cutting of the wall of the ovary so that egg is released and third is luteinization of granulosa cell so up till here i think everything will be clear okay now up till here so till the mature till till this as you can see in the figure till here this is the follicular phase this is the follicular phase and from here on this is the ovulation and this is phase is called as luteal phase now another important mcq here that only fsh is needed for folliculogenesis only fsh is needed for folliculogenesis but for the final maturation for the final maturation of uh, follicle lh is required okay it's a very important mcq that only fsh is needed for folliculogenesis but lh is needed for final maturation okay now let's talk of after once the egg is released the next phase that starts is luteal phase okay now what happens in luteal phase so in this phase after the ejection of oocyte which is now frozen in metaphase 2 as we talked earlier capillaries will start penetrating the structure so when this oocyte is out this capillaries will start penetrating the structure and they will fill this so they, now there will be a cavity as oocyte is gone the follicular fluid is gone there will be a cavity so these cap uh, capillaries will fill this cavity with blood and now it is called as corpus hemorrhagicum okay corpus means body hemorrhagicum means blood now this this structure this newly formed structure under the effect of lh which will form you know a very special type of hormone here which is required in the luteal phase called as progesterone this structure is now called as corpus luteum so corpus luteum is formed under the effect of lh it is formed in the luteal phase and it will produce a hormone called as progesterone okay now corpus luteum means granulosa cell these luteinized granulosa cell under the effect of uh, uh, LH will also produce another hormone called as inhibin A. So we have to uh, remember this, this is very important that in the follicular phase, there the granulosa cells under the effect of FSH were forming inhibin B. But here the luteinized granulosa cell under the effect of LH are forming inhibin A. So these two inhibins are same, they are isomers and they have same function then that is to inhibit FSH. So this is an important MCQ that corpus luteum forms inhibin B under the effect of LH and granulosa cell in the follicular phase under the effect of FSH forms inhibin B. Both are both uh, both of these inhibin B and A have same function to inhibit FSH. Now uh, as this progesterone is getting released we get a peak progesterone concentration at around 8th day post ovulation this is an important question when do we get peak progesterone concentration so see this graph this peak progesterone concentration we get on around 8th day of ovulation okay and another important question when is the maximum activity of corpus luteum what will be the answer when is the maximum activity of corpus luteum it's the eighth day 
eighth day only when there is peak progesterone concentration okay so due to this progesterone in high amount okay this fsh and lh r will be in the lower concentration there will be feedback inhibition from progesterone and estrogen corpus luteum also secretes some amount of estrogen so because of high high uh, concentration of progesterone and estrogen there will be negative feedback on hypothalamus and pituitary and lh and fsh levels will be low right now what will happen what will happen will progesterone keep on secreting no corpus luteum has a limited lifespan and what this is of 9 to 11 days after 9 to 11 days the corpus luteum will die this is called as luteolysis there will be apoptosis natural death corpus luteum will die this is called as luteolysis and after its death after the after luteolysis corpus luteum will be appear will appear as a whitish scarred body on the surface of the ovary which is called as corpus albicans okay now this happens if there is no pregnancy because egg is being released and egg is waiting there in fallopian tube in the anticipation of fertilization if pregnancy doesn't happen there will be luteolysis what if pregnancy happens what will happen then what will happen then the if sperm is able to fertilize egg there will be formation of embryo and there will be implantation in the uterus once embryo is implanted there will be uh, the trophoblast cells there will secrete human chorionic gonadotropin this human chorionic gonadotropin will behave like an lh and will signal corpus luteum to not undergo lysis corpus luteum will be rescued from lysis this is called as rescue of corpus luteum and why it will be rescued because in the early phases of pregnancy in order to sustain and support pregnancy corpus luteum will keep on forming estrogen and progesterone this is called as rescue of corpus luteum how long will this happen this will happen till 10 to 12 weeks of gestation after 10 to 12 weeks the placenta is formed and now corpus luteum the function of corpus luteum this hormonal production will be taken over by placenta and this is called as utero placental shift what is it called it is called as utero placental shift okay so this is about rescue of corpus luteum now another important thing is luteo follicular transition so what happens see this graph again so there is rising progesterone and rising estrogen and then after once the luteolysis is there the progesterone and estrogen will fall the progesterone and estrogen will fall now when estrogen and progesterone will fall what will what will happen the negative feedback effect of progesterone and estrogen will be lifted off from the pituitary and hypothalamus then what will happen there will be there will be what there will be as a negative feedback effect is uh, lifted off the hypothalamus will be able to uh, start pulsatile secretion of gnrh which will in turn stimulate pituitary to re release fsh and lh and the fsh and lh level will start rising but but there will be preferential secretion of fsh not lh why can you think of any reason as a negative feedback is lifted off you know when the negative feedback is lifted off when the progesterone level are you know falling down there, there is progesterone withdrawal which is also starting the menstrual flow there will be uh, there will be as a negative feedback is lifted off there will be gnrh impulses from the coming from the hypothalamus which will stimulate pituitary to release fsh why there will be preferential release of fsh there are two reasons first of all there is fall of inhibin a there is fall of inhibin a okay what was happening inhibin a is wa was inhibiting uh, fsh which was secreted by luteinized granulosa cell as there is called luteolysis inhibin a will, will fall and there will be there will be no inhibition of fsh anymore what is the second reason second reason is amplitude and frequency of gnrh impulses so it is the nature the too much detail is not known about this phenomena but it is seen that gnrh impulses are the gnrh hormone is released in a pulsatile manner so the amplitude and frequency of these gnrh pulses will determine that fsh should be released in preference to lh a particular frequency a particular amplitude will determine that fsh is released in preference to lh because we want fsh why because this fsh will now act on the primordial follicle those those primordial follicles which have undergone this gnrh independent stage of development these 70 days of growth and maturation and now they are ready to be rescued by fsh okay because if lh will come there will be what androgenic environment we don't want that we want fsh we want estrogenic environment so fsh only fsh is responsible for follicular genesis lh will be la needed later on in the follicular maturation as we talked earlier so now fsh will come 
now what will happen fsh will come and fsh will rescue these new cohort of follicles and push them in the competition in the race to become a dominant follicle okay dominant follicle so this is about ovarian cycle in the next uh, video we are going to discuss about uterine cycle okay this is it